Connecting the Dots with Dr. Wilmer Leon, where the analysis of politics, culture, and history converge. Welcome to the Connecting the Dots podcast with Dr. Wilmer Leon. I'm Wilmer Leon. So here's the point. We have a tendency to view current events as though they occur in a vacuum, failing to understand the broader historical context in which most events take place. During each episode of this show, my guests and I will have probing, provocative, and in-depth discussions that connect the dots between current events and the broader historical context in which these events occur. This will enable you to better understand and analyze the events that impact the global village in which we live. On today's episode, the issue before us is anti-imperialism in the U.S. today. What is it and what is it not? And for insight into this, my guest for the discussion is the chair of the Coordinating Committee for the Black Alliance for Peace, an editor and contributing columnist for the Black Agenda Report, and the Green Party candidate for vice president of the United States in 2016, Ajamu Baraka. As always, my brother, welcome. Good to be here, Dr. Leon. Thank you. So today's topic is based on a piece in uh, Orinoco Tribune entitled anti-imperialism in the U.S. today, what it is and is not. It's written by Stansfield Smith, and he opens his piece by quoting uh, the late Cuban president Fidel Castro saying, there is an enemy that can be called universal, an enemy whose attitude and whose actions threaten the whole world, bully the whole world. That universal enemy is Yankee imperialism. Ajamu, your thoughts on Castro's assessment, especially in the context of the recent uh, President Joe Biden and a bipartisan group of lawmakers urging the Republican-controlled House of Representatives to take up this $95 billion military aid package for Ukraine, for Israel, and Taiwan, and other allies, especially understanding if the United States wasn't using Ukraine as a proxy, you wouldn't need that money. The United States is is under is funding the uh, genocide in Gaza, and is also trying to use Taiwan as uh, uh, as the tip of the spear against China. Ajamu Baraka. Well, <clears throat> thank you so much for that for that question because it's a very important question and a very important conversation that we, we have to have. Uh, Fidel's position is in alignment with, with my position, the position I've been advocating or arguing for for the last few years, that one of the uh, issues among left forces in the US primarily, and also in Western Europe, is that they seem not to understand the difference between a primary and a secondary contradiction. That mm -hmm. is, that they don't seem to recognize that for many of us in a colonized world, in the global south, in the uh, uh, northern states, but uh, in those parts of the northern states where we are exploited uh, and nationally oppressed, that for us, the primary enemy, if you will, emanates primarily from the U.S. and its Western European allies. We see the U.S. and the Western European allies, as Fidel sees them, as in fact representing an existential threat to the rest of collective humanity. Therefore, that uh, enemy becomes the primary uh, objective of our political activity. Now, some Western left leftists, they're confused by that. And so they will look at some of the uh, uh, issues or contradictions in some of the emergent socialist uh, countries or countries with socialist aspirations, uh, countries that are just trying to build some kind of progressive uh, um, uh, movement in their, in their nations to have some breathing room for development. Uh, but who find themselves as a consequence in the crosshairs of of the U.S. and U.S. Uh, policies attempting to undermine their projects. And these leftists will focus in on those internal issues. 
giving left coverage and uh, rationalization uh, for the targeting of those nations. We see that as fundamentally contradictory. We see that as, in fact, reactionary, confusing what should be the primary objective, which is the defeat of Western imperialism uh, with the internal issues in these various states uh, as, as equal, and they aren't. Primary and secondary contradictions are, in fact, that they are different. You know, you mentioned uh, the the United States and its Western European allies. And what is even ironic now is many of those Western European allies are finding themselves being victimized by U.S. imperialism. We're looking at over the last seven months to a year, a dramatic decline in uh, productivity in Germany as a result of the United States blowing up the Nord Stream pipeline. Uh, now Europe is having to pay exorbitant amounts of money for natural gas. We find that impacting Britain. We find that impacting France. We find that all over Europe. And so, for and now, for example, for those who may have listened to uh, uh, the interview with um, Russian uh, President Putin, and you know he's he's. He's supposed to be the villain, and Donald Trump mentions uh, uh, def- uh, moving away from NATO, and folks in the in the United States were screaming, "How can Donald Trump talk about NATO like that?" And the United States attacked a NATO ally, an act of war in blowing up uh, Nord Stream. So again, you mentioned the U.S. and its allies, and now American imperialism is even attacking its Western European allies. Exactly. I mean, it's, it's, really, it's really amazing. I mean, look, one of the objectives of the, of the proxy war in Ukraine was, in fact, to, um, to ensure that there would be policies that would disarticulate the Russian economy from uh, Western Europe, specifically from the German economy. And the objective there was to weaken the German economy and also, by extension, uh, various Western economies uh, in order to uh, make uh, the further exploitation and, in fact, the intensification of the exploitation of the European market uh, more favorable to U.S. capital. And the Europeans and the European ruling class fell right into that trap. And to make sure that that plan was successful, as you indicated in your question, uh, the U.S. ensured that there will be no backsliding by <laughs> blowing up Nord Stream uh, 2. They knew that, that once the German workers, once uh, many uh, European workers uh, and even parts of the middle class uh, woke up to the fact that they had got suckered, suckered into supporting uh, this aggressive war in Ukraine and that they were being negatively impacted, that there be political pressure on these various states to reverse course and to uh, to to re-engage with the Russians. Well, the U.S. said, oh, no, <laughs> you're not going backwards. In fact, we're going to make sure that by blowing up this pipeline and making sure that you, uh, you uh, remain now dependent on the importation of liquefied natural gas coming from where? From the U.S. As Blinken, as Anthony Blinken said, the Secretary of State of, of the U.S. Uh, this is a marvelous opportunity for 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 the U.S. And so yeah, that that was part of the objective of this war. It, it was it was a war to enhance uh, the positionality of U.S. capital in Europe. In fact, going back to I, I made reference to uh, Vladimir Putin's interview with Tucker Carlson, and Putin raised the question. He says. Well, you blew up part of Nord Stream because folks don't know there's Nord Stream 1 and Nord Stream 2. He said you blew up part of Nord Stream. One of the pipes still works. Why don't you turn it up? He said Europe can get natural gas from Russia through Ukraine. There are pipelines running through Ukraine that could carry natural gas to Europe. He says turn it up. He says there are pipelines that run from Russia through Poland. You can get natural gas through Poland. He says, why don't you turn those up? 
That all goes back to Western hegemony and imperialism. Ajah Mubaraka. It, it goes back to the issue of the European ruling class um, not understanding that they have interests that are really counter to those of the U.S. And that irrational policy of allowing themselves to be suckered into uh, this, this proxy war and not looking out for their own nat uh, national interests is resulting in real uh, political issues within their countries. Not only the issue of, of natural gas, you and I talked about on another one of your programs, this issue with <laughs> using the Ukrainian war, uh, the, the U.S. capital that's gone in and basically uh, bought up some of the best land in Ukraine, and, and are now uh, exporting from Ukraine various agricultural products. They are using the, the war uh, to as a battering ram to avoid or to circumvent the requirements of, of, of the importation of agricultural products across Europe um, and imposing the products from Ukraine into various European markets uh, as a act of solidarity. Well. The, the problem with that, of course, is it's undermining the positions of, of European farmers across Western Europe. And so you find that farmers in places like uh, France and other countries, I say, hey, wait a minute. You know, we are now losing money because of our markets now being flooded with these with, with wheat and other products coming in from Ukraine. You know, what is this? We have to. Uh, engage in production by very uh, uh, clear, meticulous um, uh, requirements, regulations, and now using this this solidarity issue uh, with with the Ukrainian war, you are undermining our, our position. You are undermining our ability to make a living, and so that's causing real political issues in these various nations. So these these policies being pursued by by these, these these European nations are really are really uh, such that you know they are putting themselves in a position where they are they are creating um, issues for themselves politically that they're going to find it very difficult to reverse uh, very soon as, as a matter of fact in the next few months and in fact uh, to that point talking about agriculture there are farmers in Germany. That are that have been protesting for weeks. They're dumping manure in the roads. They're 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 doing a lot of uh, activism, real on the ground, practical activism, uh, it, it, to show their resistance to the policies that you're mentioning. And also, they're incredibly angry because a lot of the subsidies that the government was providing to them. Uh, in order to offset the price differentials that they were experiencing as a result of flooding the market with Ukrainian products, those subsidies have been cut, if not totally eliminated, as the German government, as the French government, as other EU countries are sending more money to Ukraine. So many of them, many of these Western Europeans are experiencing a lot of the same uh, issues there that many in the United States are suffering here as our infrastructure is in decline, as our schools are underfunded, as healthcare costs are going up and people are, as homelessness is on the rise, we can find $95 billion to send to Ukraine and to send to Israel and, and to send to uh, Taiwan. All three of those fights are fights that would not be ongoing if the United States hadn't started them, but we can't seem to find the way to take care of Americans here in the United States. We can't find the way, uh, Dr. Leon, because we can't have a, a honest and open and free national conversation because the same uh, interests that are, uh, are, are advancing themselves in Western Europe are the same interests that control the means of communication in the U.S. And so therefore, a, a conversation with the uh, people of the U.S. around what really makes sense in terms of policy. Does it make sense to, to have $886 billion devoted toward uh, defense, so-called defense? Um, uh, or should we use some of that those resources 
to in fact address issues of homelessness, invest in, in education, uh, create the conditions where everybody can have access to health care, um, pay for free education, you know, for at the universe up to the through the university level. You know, the US population is paying a price for supporting uh, the policies that only are benefiting a small minority of the population. In fact, about uh, 1% of the population. So that kind of, of understanding, that kind of discussion is not taking place. It's only taking place in spaces like this, in alternative media spaces. Um, and as a consequence, it makes it very difficult for us to turn the corner uh, with uh, advancing uh, policies that make more sense that address the real interests of the, of the American people. And in this piece, uh, anti-imperialism in the U.S. today, what it is and is not, Stansfield Smith, he, he draws the distinction between progressives and anti-imperialists. He says that imperialism uses human rights and democracy issues in countries that it is targeting for regime change as a rationale for foreign interference and that many progressives swallow and even join in these disinformation campaigns uh, to support these moves where, in contrast, anti-imperialists, uh, they focus on uncovering and bringing to light U.S. disinformation and interference in national sovereignty. So can you elaborate a little bit on this issue? He talks about progressives versus anti-imperialists. You use, in many instances, use the term the left. Uh, if you could, because we hear these these references, we hear these terms uh, bantied about all the time, but uh, and and many people mistakenly think that they're all the same, but in fact they're not. Well, they really aren't, and I, I'm, I'm I'm really I'm, I'm glad you had you raised that question. Uh, I think the way Stansfield is using that term, and many others, when you talk about progressives, you're really talking about uh, liberals. Um, and maybe social democrats, that is those individuals who have uh, who have politics and uh, very similar to say, say, for example, Bernie Sanders, who's a social democrat, who have a sort of soft social socialistic orientations. Um, uh, Bernie Sanders, Cornel West, as opposed to elements of the left that are not only anti-imperialist, uh, but of course, anti-capitalist. Uh, who are who have politics that suggest that uh, this global system of, of colonial capitalism has to be transcended and be replaced with, with a new kind of political economy, one that's organized around socialistic lines. Uh, and so that that to me constitutes the the left, the real left, if you will. But even within that camp, if you will, there's still some issues. In terms of how one gets to socialism, um, and that's where they have some of the confusion because even among the left, they will sometimes find themselves inadvertently, often, uh, providing political cover uh, to the U.S. because they are in opposition to a, a particular nation's uh, experiment, be it Nicaragua, Cuba, or Venezuela, uh, Peru, or, or, or Bolivia. That if 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 the politics aren't developing in ways in which these Western uh, leftists believe they should be developing, if they don't correspond to some kind of imagined model, then they will find they will begin to 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 criticize those those experiments. At the same time, that those experiments find themselves in the crosshairs of U.S. subversion. That's backward. It's backward and it's contradictory. So that is. That that is the issue that this, that that uh, Smith is uh, alluding to uh, in that very important article. And but Dr. Leon, yes, there's there's another element to this. Okay, e e even the the way in which the 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 bourgeoisie, which mean meaning the bourgeoisie, meaning the ruling class, uh, has used uh, and weaponized democracy and human rights in order to. Uh, obscure is real interest in, in undermining these various nations. As a consequence of Gaza, they're not going to be able to 
to use those weapons like they did in the past because if they have now been exposed. It's quite clear to so many people around the world and even people within the US, the hypocrisy of those positions. What happened to the responsibility to protect a component of, of humanitarian intervention uh, in order to protect the human rights of, of certain collectives? It doesn't exist when it comes to the Palestinians. So, you know, they're, they have undermined in their own short-term uh, greed in their own short-term uh, uh, pursuits to undermine a very uh, uh, important and powerful weapon they used to use to be able to obscure uh, their reactionary politics. To that point, it is, it is really amazing when you look at how long uh, the Palestinians have been uh, exposed to uh, to the genocide, um, how long that struggle has been ongoing, and how quickly things turn post October sixth. That th- and and one of the ways that I have described it is I, I tell people that that Israel has bombed the world into reality. That now that this horror. Now that this genocide is playing itself out on the on your on your on your telephone screens, not to mention your computers and 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 your home your home screens, the atrocities um, are have uh, the, the reality of these tro- atrocities have just decimated the myths. Exactly, and and they 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 are never going to be able to return back to the ideological status quo. They have exposed themselves. We have seen behind the curtain, and we we understand now the reality of the naked power that they are exercising to try to maintain their global control. We now see the nature of the settler colonial project um, in Israel. And by extension, we're, we're getting a better understanding of the settler colonial project in the territory called the United States of America. At the, at the core of these projects is the reality of naked violence to establish those regimes and to maintain them. So that understanding of the nature of colonialism coupled with a, a deeper understanding of the nature of capitalism disconnected is radicalizing millions of people across the globe and millions of people within the U.S. So the, the politics going forward are going to be fundamentally different, but is, is going to be different, but even more dangerous, Dr. Leon. Why? Without the ideological weapon that they were able to use to, to, to impose um, uh, conformity and support for their policies, now they're going to be more and more dependent on the use of naked force. That's why you find the naked use of force uh, in various local environments. That's why you see in Atlanta, for example, uh, the use of RICO laws to uh, criminalize the opposition to to Cop City. Uh, These are uh, examples of of the hysterical reaction from the rulers to this, this change in consciousness. That's why the Uhuru 3 is facing federal prosecution. Uh, because of their 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 opposition to uh, the policies uh, in in Ukraine, so the repressive apparatus and the repressive network of of the state is being strengthened and being utilized against this growing uh, consciousness that's being manifested within the United States of America. And another place where I believe that we're going to see this manifest itself is in the Middle East itself. Uh, Hassan Nasrallah, the head of uh, Hezbollah in Lebanon, recently gave a speech where he said, and and I'll paraphrase, he said, you know, basically, for as horrific as all of this is, he said, this is really going beyond the Palestinians and that this is an issue for the entire region. And there have been a number of interpretations of of that statement. What that says to me is he is not only speaking uh, to the Palestinians that he is, and speaking to 
to uh, uh, Ansar Allah in Yemen and others. He's letting the United States know, he's letting the West know that you all are about to start a global conflict that he's saying everybody in the pool and because they see themselves as facing a common oppressor, they see themselves facing a common enemy. And he's saying, you all are about to ignite a fuse, the likes of which you will not be able to exterminate or, 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 or put out. And it's going to be all adults in the pool. And it, the result isn't going to be very, very positive. No, you know, Dr. Leon, and what, what's going to really like that is if, if there is, in fact, a ground assault in Rafa. Uh, the Egyptians have already said that that can very easily uh, result in the cancellation of Camp David. Uh, the Saudis have said that there's going to be dire circumstances. Um, this is going to, see, what, what has happened is that these policies have forced these, these monarchs and all of these Arab and Muslim uh, right-wing elements, they have to respond to the pressure that they are feeling from their own populations. The, the, the so horrific what is happening in Gaza, uh, they can no longer uh, collaborate uh, under the table uh, you, know, uh, you know, with the US. They are being now forced to take more forthright positions in opposition to what's happening in, in Palestine. That, and you couple uh, uh, what is happening on the, on the uh, Israeli-Lebanon border with Hezbollah. You look at uh, what is happening with the Hutus that have basically shut down shipping as it relates to ships going into and supporting Israel. Um, and you, 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 you see that, that this, these unwise policies are creating a situation that uh, can very easily span out of control. And even elements within the US uh, believe that this has gone too far. Uh, and that's why you find some, you know, some fleeting uh, commentary from uh, Genocide Joe uh, talking about that the Israelis have gone uh, over the top because now they understand uh, the real possibility of this igniting a regional conflict that they're not going to be able to control if it does in fact uh, lead to that. And they they know that you have a, a leadership in Israel that's uh, being, I mean, you have a lunatic that's in power. You have a right-wing racist uh, settler um, uh, 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 regime that is engaged in uh, murder, not only uh, supporting the murder in Gaza, but they are actively murdering Palestinians on the West Bank. Over 400 Palestinians have been murdered by settlers since October the 7th. So this is creating a situation that's untenable. And so there has to be a pullback. Yesterday, uh, uh, the Moody, Moody uh, Credit Agency downgraded Israeli stocks, downgraded the economy. There is a real economic consequence now developing. So um, it's a very dangerous situation that uh, uh, the wiser elements of the international ruling class uh, is, is saying we've got to get a hold of this. And talk about how this hypocrisy of the United States is has been exposed, is being exposed, and the international reaction. What, am I, what I mean by that is, as we sit and look at uh, the genocide that is taking place in Gaza, and the United States is paying for it. The United States is arming it. And and on one hand, you hear Tony Blinken saying, I'm traversing the region. I'm talking to the leaders. I'm asking them to be very careful. Basically, what he's saying is he's asking for a kinder, gentler genocide. And Joe Biden is saying that we are concerned about the Palestinians and while, in fact, he's not telling Netanyahu, I'll just pull the plug on your money and we'll put a stop to this thing in about two or three days. How is what are what's your take, your sense um, as you travel the world and, and speak and speak to those around the world? How is that hypocrisy resonating 
uh, around the world. Uh, the result of this is that the U.S. has lost uh, prestige it will never regain, that uh, the world understands that uh, the, the, the U.S. and Europe is basically finished, um, and that uh, nations are, are deciding that they're going to uh, put their, their eggs in a different basket, uh, and that basket is called BRICS this emerging group of nations uh, that now control something like uh, 36% of global GDP, as opposed to the G7 that's controlling about 30%. The shift has already taken place materially. Now the shift is taking place ideologically and politically. So it is a, a shift in momentum, it is a recognition that for all intents and purposes, uh, the decline of the, of the West is irreversible, but it's also a recognition of, of the danger that all of this poses for all of us, because it becomes quite clear when you see the support that all of the Western nations have given to the Israeli fascists, that the West is prepared to blow up the world before they voluntarily surrender uh, power. Now, wait a, minute. The wait, 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 wait a minute. Elaborate on that, because a lot of people will hear you say blow up the world. Oh, that's hyperbole. Oh, he's just being over the top. Oh, that Ajamu Baraka. He's so dramatic. Um, but no, that's real talk. Yeah, it really is, because they, 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 they were, they're still flirting with the possibility of a nuclear confrontation in Ukraine. There's still the possibility of some kind of wild and reckless attack by the Israelis uh, on on Iran and even the use of a nuclear weapon. There is the situation we haven't touched on yet. And that is the 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 unwise policies on the part of the U.S. in providing support to and propping up and encouragement to the the government on on, on the island of Taiwan. Uh, the provocative moves being made um, in, in the South China Sea, uh, the whole pivot toward Asia. There is always the possibility of this, these, these situations escalating to a nuclear confrontation. And it seems like that there are elements within the foreign policy community uh, that believe that they, in fact, can not only escalate, but they can engage in a first strike and win. There are people openly talking like Dr. Strangelove and talking about the possibility of winning a nuclear confrontation. And that's what makes it so incredibly dangerous because when you have missiles uh, in Western Europe, for example, in, in Poland and in, uh, Romania uh, and other places that are theoretically defensive, according to the U.S., uh, but the Russians know that they can be uh, uh, re, 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 recalculated, if you will, or refitted in a matter of minutes and to become offensive, which means that you have uh, the ability to strike from, say, Poland uh, to Moscow in six minutes. Now you have uh, the Russians who are on a, a hair trigger alert. They have to launch on warning because you can't allow your nuclear arsenal to be caught in the silos. So when you have situations in the past where there were uh, computer glitches, uh, where one side thought that the other side had launched, on, uh, had launched, we had 30 minutes to correct it. We have documented situations where that in fact happened at least on two or three occasions. How do you do that when you are uh, on, um, on, on a trigger hair uh, launch on warning in, in six minutes? So it's very, very dangerous. So that's what we're referring to. This is not hyperbole. People talk about, you know, in five years, I'm going to be doing so and so and so. I'm like, are you sure you're going to be here in five years? Yeah, I'm being dramatic because I'm being for real. I can, we can see the possibilities of these maniacs escalating a situation to the point uh, of a nuclear confrontation because the amateurs, Dr. Leon, <laughs> they, 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 the gap between the leadership in places like Russia and China and the U.S. and in Western Europe, it is it's, it's, it's never been bigger before. These are they don't know what they are doing. 
And that's what makes us so incredibly uh, dangerous for all of us. You know, you just mentioned uh, the mistake being made, and that uh, that is not theoretical. I want to say it was it was 1983. Uh, a, a Russian, I don't even know what his title is, but th- he's in a silo, in a Russian silo. His name is Stan. His name is Stanislav Petrov, and he is a missile technician. I'll call him sitting in a in a in a Russian silo, looking at his screen. And he sees a blip on his screen. And the the protocol is when you see this blip, you push a button. And when you push that button, silos open, missiles come up, we're ready to launch. But he thinks that there's something wrong with the blip on his screen. Right. And thank God he did, because by his taking just a couple of minutes to be rational and to think, what he found out was, it wasn't an incoming missile. It was a mistake in a, in a software program that, that miscalculated or misinterpreted something that was transpiring. So that was 1983. Folks can look this up. Stanislav Petrov is, was, is his name. And if it hadn't been for him, we would have been in, the, in a nuclear conflict. And what you just talked about in terms of missiles in Poland and in Yugoslavia and other places, that's one of the big reasons why Russian President Putin is so hell-bent on um, Ukraine not being, not becoming a part of NATO, because he says, and he's right, if, if Ukraine becomes a part of NATO, NATO will put missiles in Ukraine. You've now cut my response time from seven or eight minutes to three minutes, which means Stanislav Petrov, God bless his soul, that doesn't work anymore. Launch on notice. And the other point is, Putin has made this point a number of times, saying, look, you guys got to understand something. I got missiles too. I got missiles like you got missiles. And in the West, that gets spun as Vladimir Putin is threatening to use nuclear weapons. No, what he's telling you is, if you think you can come in here and punch me in the face, understand I can punch back. I have what you have. And now what we're seeing from a technological perspective is what they got is a little better. Than, than, than what we're used to seeing. So this is not hyperbole. This is not fant- fantasy. Uh, this is this is real talk. Yeah, no, they have they have they have, they have demonstrated with their, their supersonic weapons that they have uh, hypersonic uh, hypersonic weapons. They have a, a have a technological advantage that the U.S. and not been able to uh, to catch up with yet. No, it's, it's very dangerous. Well, um, wait a minute, wait a minute. To, and to, to that point. When when President Biden, because I, I, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I want people to understand this isn't theoretical hyperbole. When no. Joe when Joe Biden sent the USS Gerald Ford into the Mediterranean Sea as a show of force uh, to Hezbollah and and to the Houthis, um, Vladimir Putin said, Joe. Why are you doing this? You're not scaring anybody. You're not scaring. He said, these people don't scare. And oh, by the way, we can sink your aircraft carrier from the Black Sea with our armed missiles, the Kinjal missiles. He said, and they're hypersonic. You won't even know they're coming until this until your aircraft carrier is sinking. And that's real talk. You, you know, and what's what's also kind of funny but tragic at the same time is that while they are engaged in provocative activity in 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 the Indo-Pacific region, um, outside of Taiwan and in, in the Taiwan Straits, the the Pentagon has has war has war gamed uh, a confrontation between the U.S. and right. China, and I think we talked about it before. And they were lost every time. 
25 out of 25. So it's like, what are these people doing? What are you doing? The whole concept that, that was coming out of the out of the project for a new American century, in which they argue that the U.S. had the capacity to fight two uh, theater wars simultaneously. That should have been put to rest when they lost both in Afghanistan and in Iraq. Uh, basically, global South nations. But now they are uh, actually, a few months ago, you thought they were really going insane because they are fighting in Ukraine and they are fighting in Ukraine. Yes. Make no mistake about that. Is the Ukrainians that are are, are 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 dying, but this is a Western and U.S. war. Why at the same time they were uh, 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 needling the the Chinese? So it's like, what are you? You all are going to fight the the Russians and the Chinese at the same time? It it, it wasn't making. And they are allies. Yeah. Well, well part of the conflict you got, that we're talking you got to throw, throw North Korea in there too. Well, part of the conflict, part of the element that we talk about when we talk about what's happening in Ukraine in terms of, of the secondary objectives of this proxy war, it was to weaken the Russians to the point where they would not be a very effective ally to the Chinese. Mm -hmm. The target was not just Russia. It was also it was Germany, right. as we talked about, right. and the Chinese. Right. So they were creating a situation where they were going to win regardless of what happened in their They're own imagination. There are some neocons that thought you could go at China directly. There were some neocons that believed that you could go at Russia directly. And then there were others who believe the way you get to China, you've got to go through Russia. Yes, exactly. All are wrong. All are wrong. Well, they were proven wrong. I mean, we, you know, the, the Russian economy was supposed to be destroyed uh, you know, as a, as a consequence of this, of this conflict. And as uh, Putin indicated in that in that uh, interview that the Russian economy is the stronger than there's ever been. Mm -hmm. Every time they have imposed a series of of sanctions against the, the Russians, even Putin said this a couple of years ago, it allowed him to impose economic reforms that he couldn't have done without the sanctions. He made the oligarchy disengage from the European economy. And, and and reinvest in 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 the Russian economy, so they have become more economically independent as a consequence of these of these uh, of these sanctions. So it's always been the it's been counterproductive, and you have some realists in the U.S. foreign policy community that predicted that, but the realists have 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 had had to take a second, uh, have had to you know stand back. Uh, and allow these neocons uh, who have been driving policy in both administration, both parties, for the last for the last twenty years, basically or more, and the the result is the U.S. is weaker than it's ever been since the end of the Second uh, Imperialist War that we call it, uh, World War II. Another example, and I think a more a more a practical example, and what I mean by practical is it doesn't involve the oligarchs; it involves the everyday Russian person. One of the things when when President Biden told us that as a result of this Ukraine conflict that he was going to turn the ruble into rubble and by imposing sanctions on on the Russian uh, economy, one of the things that they were projecting was or predicting was that the Russian citizens would run to the Russian banks and take their money out of the banks and and put their money other places. And <laughs> what Putin did was he raised the interest rates. One of the things that he did was he raised the interest rates that the banks would pay on deposits. Right. So the Russian citizens <laughs> found, oh, I'll make more money if I leave my money in the bank. And what a lot of people don't know about him Dude has a PhD in in eco, in, he's in, uh, in economics. Not only is he an attorney, he has a PhD in economics. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> he has a little bit of understand. He's a he has a better understanding of econ than Joe Biden. Look, I mean, Joe Biden's a moron. I mean, most of the U.S. leadership are, are morons. 
Uh, one thing we can say about uh, Barack Obama, though, he was not in that same category. He was just a uh, a, a slickster. Uh, and same thing with, with, with Bill Clinton. But the, the quality of the leadership in the U.S. state has been appallingly, I mean, it's been, it's been, it's been dangerously, frighteningly um, um, uh, incompetent. And that's the thing that scares me the most, that we are going to trip up into a situation that the, U- the U.S. is not going to be able to reverse. And all of us will suffer uh, as a consequence. Look, when you hear, uh, no matter what your opinion may be of, of Putin or, or, or President Xi, when they speak and even the way they comport themselves. Yes. These are, these are adults. These are statesmen, if you will. Yes. And then you compare that to these idiots in the U.S. Started with Genocide Joe and these 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 idiots who are making policy both in the Democrat and Republican parties. There's no there's no gravitas. There's no worldly sophistication. They're just like country bumpkins. You know, they are so incredibly unsophisticated and adolescent. That's the term that I use when you to, to describe U.S. U.S. culture. It's an adolescent, dangerous culture, and 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 because it has so much uh, power, that's what makes it so incredibly dangerous to all of us. Okay, so you know that 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 people need. If you haven't seen this, check out that interview. You can have your views about Putin and, and right. the cartoon character that's been drawn up for you by by your bosses, but you cannot conclude that this is not a states person with a, a sophisticated understanding of the world. If you look at a couple of examples of what you're talking about, particularly as it relates to the Chinese, I'm not even going to get into uh, uh, Secretary Lavrov because that dude is oh just brilliant. But Wang Yi, the foreign secretary of China, uh, early in the early in the Biden administration, Tony Blinken was supposed to meet with the Chinese delegation in Anchorage, Alaska. And so they all convene in Anchorage and Blinken starts lecturing the Chinese. And they look at him and they say, what are you doing? You have no idea who you're talking to. We didn't come here to be lectured by you. We're China. We hold your debt. You don't hold ours. And they got up and walked out. You know, they, but, got, but, but, they, they got up and walked out. But, you know, but it, and, and it, 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 what was so incredible about that was this was the clumsy um, um, attempt on the part of the Biden administration to to assert their white maleness. They're going to they're going to show that they they that it was whiteness. We, we we're going to show we running the show with these these Chinese. I mean, it was incredible. And that's it, like you said, the well, Chinese the, said the sick, the you sick man of Asia. Us. You don't, you're not competent enough to criticize us. Right. Right. Our culture is thousands of years old. Uh, and then you've got the the whole uh, spy balloon, spy balloon. What a, what a lot of people don't understand is Tony Blinken said, "I'm going to China to meet with President Xi." He was not invited. He said, "I'm going to China," and Xi said, "No." But he said, "I'm I'm coming to China." So usually diplomats are welcomed in Beijing. President Xi said, okay, well, if you're coming, I can't remember the name of the city, but there's another city where they send lesser caliber diplomats and folks that they really don't want to deal with. He said, I'm going to send you here. I'm not going to meet you in Beijing and I'm not even come see you there. And, And Blinken got embarrassed. And that's when the balloon comes in the jet stream, the weather balloon comes in the jet stream as weather balloons will do. And they and they used that, calling it a spy balloon, as a uh as the basis of, oh, you're sending a spy balloon, therefore I can't come see you. No, it was 
it was Xi didn't want to totally embarrass Blinken by saying, I'm not going to let you in my country. What he said was, I'm going to send you off to the hinterlands and you can go on a tour if you want to. And Tony Blinken said, well, no, I ain't doing that. I mean, those are just examples. And they don't get explained as such by Western yeah. media, but that's what really happened. Look, uh, Dr. Leon, I was in China a couple of months ago. There we go. And um, Am I right? You are absolutely right. I'm going to tell you. They, they, they can't be, they, 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 they can't be defeated. They, they, this, what they are building there is absolutely incredible. I'm sitting on this bullet train going from Beijing to uh, Shanghai. And I had a, a cup of, of water and I was doing something. And I put it down and I realized, oh, the water's on the, on the, on the floor. Cause you know, when you fly, when you, when you do Amtrak, you know how they're on Amtrak. You know? <laughs> They have a, a just like ticker ticker tape thing on the on the end of the car that, that tells you how fast the train is going. We sitting there going three hundred and twenty five miles an hour. It's like you're not even moving. You're going across the countryside. It's it's flat plains, and then you look up, and then there's a city with skyscrapers. I mean, and I don't want to go into it too much, but I mean, you know what I saw in just those few days I was there was incredible. And so, you know, they're not keeping, they're not allowing people to understand what's happening in China. They have an urban, uh, urban development uh, policy that when they, when they create these cities and these, these communities, every social service in that community has to be within a 15 minute walk. The hospitals, the, the schools, the elder care, we, we, 15 minute walk. Okay, it's fully integrated. Everything that you need, all right? So, uh, I mean, you know, you compare this, and you know, what I saw in terms of infrastructure, it made it, it made the U.S. look like, unfortunately, like a, a, in a, a developing country. And see, the bourgeoisie they know this, but they're not telling the U.S. population how far behind the U.S. has fallen. Well, and a perfect example of that is five G technology. Wow. The Chinese approached the United States, I'll say now, 15 years ago, about working with the Chinese on developing 5G. And the United States said, no, we're not, we, we don't need, we don't need to work with you on that. And so China went ahead and developed 5G. And with that, we're talking about the Internet of Things and the ability of your refrigerator to talk to your cell phone to talk to your car all of that kind of stuff and the united and so now when you turn on your phone it says 5g but what the united states does not all we really have is faster 4g it's not truly the 5g technology that huawei and other chinese companies have de have developed and they're now they're on their way to 6 and 7g we just don't get it. Well, and you know, and the funny thing about it too, the U.S. thought that they were going to undermine the Chinese by by undermining their ability to have access to advanced uh, uh, chips. Yes. But they are rapidly developing their own capacity for that. And see, people don't understand that's part of the struggle with Taiwan. Also, Had, with the the home of one of the largest. Uh, right. uh, semiconductor chip factory on, in, in the world. And TSC, is that what it is? Something like that, yeah. Right. And that, that reincorporation of Taiwan into China would be, would be a nonviolent and relatively seamless if it wasn't for the agitation on the part of the U.S. This notion that the Chinese want to invade Taiwan militarily is all complete and utter nonsense. There is a political process there, that was developing in favor of the Chinese until the last few years, when the U.S. really began to ramp up its uh, its meddling within within the uh, the Taiwanese political system. So yeah, that's part of the issue. That basically, you know, uh, the, the technological advances uh, that uh, the the U.S. has, and they still have some, 
is being that gap is being narrowly is being progressively narrowed down. And as we move on to 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 our final segment, uh, there were there have been studies and reports put out by various elements within the government that if China were to invade Taiwan, and and that's not on anybody's drawing board. That, I, I, I always cha- challenge folks that want to have this conversation with me. Show me one time where President Xi Jinping has said that they're planning to invade China. You can't find it because they're not going to do it. But the United States has says if that were to happen, the United States would blow up the TSC. I think it's TSC um, chip manufacturing uh, facilities. So that they would not fall into the hands of China. And now China has designed its own chips. It's on its way. Necessity is the mother of invention. And and China is on its way. I want to I want to tie something else in into get coming back to the northern hemisphere. And and that is um, this uh, this uh, immigrant conversation, all of this conversation about. Uh, the, the Republicans are trying to hold the Republicans in the House are trying to hold up this defense uh, bill because they say there's not um, there's not enough money for the immigration bill. But in all of this bipartisan discussion about immigration, nobody talks about the American foreign policy in the region, as in Central America and South America that is basically forcing these people to leave their homes and come here. The analogy I use is if you're sitting in your basement watching a game and water starts coming down your stairway, you want to close the basement door instead of going upstairs and figuring out, oh, either your tub is overflowing or your sink is, your kitchen sink is overflowing. They just want to close the, they don't want to turn off the spigot. And the way you turn off the spigot is by changing your policy that is decimating the economies of Nicaragua, decimating the economies of, of all of these other countries in Central and South America. They never talk about the U.S. foreign policy that creates the motivation or motivates these folks to want to come here. They just talk about building a wall to keep them, to keep them in Mexico. No, they don't. They don't talk about that. And what's what's interesting too is that you remember at one point the Democrats pretended to be the party of progressive immigration policy. But who talks about that now? Now they are the party that has embraced the same kind of policies of of Donald Trump: border security, expanding a wall. So there is there is consensus now among uh, both. Um, uh, wings of the ruling class represented by the Republicans and the Democrats Mm -hmm. uh, on this issue of of so-called border control. And no, they're never going to talk about the kinds of of imperialist policies that are decimating the economies of of, of Central uh, America and parts of of South America, driving immigration. Uh, That's not part of their analytical framework. Uh, and so an understanding of, of these forces, again, has to come from sources like your show and other alternative sources that uh, help people to understand the complexities of the world. And sometimes they, how simple some things are, like you destroy an economy and people have to find a way to uh, to survive. And they are a few hundred miles away from the uh, most powerful and richest country on the planet, we need to go there. You know, it's quite simple. So this is what has to be dealt with, a better understanding on the part of people in the U.S. to these very these, these, these issues and understand that you have more in common uh, with these, these migrants uh, than, than, you, than you understand. That basically, if we're able to put a break on these imperialist policies, these exploitative policies in Latin America, in South America, and in the U.S., then we have the material basis for all of us to live a little better, okay? 
So that's really what we need to be going. That's the level of understanding we have to arrive at. And you talked about, I'll use these words, the misinformation and the disinformation in Western media. I, I want to hit on one more thing but before, before you go, if you can just give me two or three more minutes. Uh, and that's Haiti. And that could be three hours on its own. But this is from the Washington Post this week. Rebel leader who ousted Aristide set sights on Haiti's current leader. The crisis here keep compounding. Armed gangs have forced more than 300,000 from their homes. The police are outgunned and overmatched. Half the people don't have enough to eat. This Caribbean nation of 11 million has no dramatic, uh, democratically elected officials. The National Assembly is empty. The presidency is vacant. That's left Ariel Henry, the ele unelected and deeply reviled prime minister in charge appointed by President Jovio Moise days before Moise's still unsolved assassination in 2021. Henri was due to leave office on Wednesday, but has so far successfully stymied a political transition. They're talking about Guy Philippe coming back into, into Haiti. And this is written as though the United States has had absolutely no involvement in the decimation of Haiti. And so people read this from the Washington Post and they go, oh, these poor, ignorant, silly Haitians, they just can't seem to do anything for themselves. We must intervene and save them from themselves. Doesn't talk about Guy Philippe and he was an American operative and how much time he spent in American prisons and how, by the way, does he get back into Haiti after all? None of that. Ajamu Baraka. You're absolutely right. And and the situation in Haiti has become almost untenable. And that's how they want it. He was he was reinserted into Haiti to 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 um, to intensify the chaos, to make the situation even more ripe for outside intervention. Uh, they don't trust him. He doesn't trust them. But there is a convergence of interests, short term interests, that is financial uh, so interests. Financial interests, political interests. Right. It, it is a terrible situation in, in that country. Uh, and one that we have to continue to monitor because the result of this situation is going to be the possibility of more violence inside the country as a consequence of those issues. And this is another example of the United States through what it created called the Global Fragilities Act. It is creating the fragility and then exactly. claiming we now have to use the U.S. military to go in and resolve the chaos that we created in the first place. Exactly. That is the objective. That could be the end result if we uh, if we don't stop it. Brother Ajamu Baraka, I want to thank you so much for joining me today. My pleasure. Thank you so much, Dr. Leon. I want to thank you all for listening to the Connecting the Dots podcast with me, Dr. Wilmer Leon. Please stay tuned for new episodes every week. Also, follow and subscribe. Leave a review, share the show. Please share the show. Follow me on social media. You can find all the links below in the show description. I'm going to see you again next time. Until then, I'm Dr. Wilmer Leon. Have a great one. And remember that this is where the analysis of politics, culture, and history converge. Talk without analysis is just chatter and we don't chatter on connecting the dots. Peace and blessings. I'm out. Connecting the dots with Dr. Wilmer Leon, where the analysis of politics, culture, and history converge.